Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gilberto, for this uh, excellent talk. I, I particularly appreciate two points of your presentation. One, making a very strong case for the need of conceptual work and, and ontological work in particular, so that we really need a kind of conceptual structure in order to interpret data, right? So data is not just out there labeled. In a, in a, you know, data always refers to something in reality, and un unless we understand the identity, individuation, conditions of these things in reality, we, can need, we can't even tell if that data is about one single thing or multiple things, where the thing stops, if it is the same thing or not, and so on. I, I like this very, very much for the need of this kind of complementary work. In a time where we are, we are living in a kind of, uh, you know, number crunching dogmatism. So I really appreciate that. Uh, the second point is, uh, you know, you make a very strong case for the need of taking events seriously. And this is uh, this is great. I mean, this was mentioned by Nicola in the first presentation in the series, but it appeared in Oscar Pastor's uh, presentation. And last week we had the presentation by Monique Snook that was really about uh, viewpoint consistency, considering the two fundamental aspects of reality, structure and events, right? Uh, so I think this is really great. Events are extremely interesting and they have been somehow neglected in the in the literature of conceptual modeling and ontology. So thanks a lot for that. Um, so before I move to the questions of the audience, I'll ask some questions myself so that people can get uh, warmed up. So my first question is about your personal trajectory. So how did you get interested and involved in conceptual work, semantic work, ontologies, and so on. Thank you, Giancarlo. Uh, well, it's because of uh, many things, but uh, perhaps the, the thing is a uh, frustration uh, upon uh, seeing what what is uh, what is the state of the art. And this is, goes back now 30 years. Uh, the state of the art on Earth's observation, which more or less says, OK, I take an image, I take some measures, I produce a map, and I pr produce a paper, and bam, and, and, and then say, OK, is this useful? What are you representing? Uh, because it's uh, trying to get away from the loop of self-containment. If I say that what, if I posit the classes and identify those classes in a map, I'm self completely self-contained. And, and it's not an open discussion about the world. You don't have a set of agreed, uh, agreed, uh, let's say, descriptions that you are classifying uh, against, but you're just saying, oh, I think this is here and I'm going. So the every if you look at the papers and the literature, each uh, it's like each paper has its own categorization. This is frustrating. And, and the other thing is trying to understand, and the other point was the dynamics. Dynamics is for me something that I've been working on for a long time, and, and to understand what, what changes when I consider time. And, and this led to me to read uh, Nicola's work, uh, Barry Smith's work. So I'm mostly someone who has had an enormous benefit from reading the ontology literature. I consider myself much more someone who, whose work has benefited from reading the ontology literature and some of that, uh, rather than someone who has contributed. I think what has contributed to me is much more important because it has opened my mind. And this is what I tell everybody. Open your mind. Look at look out there. There's a lot of people who have thought long and hard about difficult problems and just don't think they don't exist just because you're not dealing with them immediately. I think it's very nice the way you put, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the the role of ontologists as as a mechanism for helping conceptual clarification at the center of all this, right? You were you were working in an area that uh, you know it's a very critical domain that it's uh, very complex, but it's also critical in the sense that it has immediate political consequences and and therefore is in the center also of kind of semantic war. So conceptual clarification. Is, uh, is of the essence there. And uh, I remember you had the great stories on, uh, you told me more than once on how ontology and its power of conceptual clarification saved you, uh, quote unquote, <laughs> in, in some situations, right? Uh, I don't know if you wanna say anything about this. Well, uh, I think that the whole, the whole issue here was that 
I mean, the 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 one of the issues here about the spatial ontologies is this this okay trying to characterize better what we're looking for. And in Brazil, the, one of the crucial uh, measures is deforestation. And uh, to characterize deforestation, you would say, OK, what is this? Uh, what is this? Is this a situation which is static? So this was uh, before. There's a before and after. Like there is a day when you go to the barber shop and you, you, you know, cut your hair and now you're you're bald headed. When in fact you recognize that this is a step by step event. And this is, of course, one of the crucial. If you think now on the application side, this is what really you want. Why? Because you don't want to wait until someone clears all the area of forest to call a police to investigate whether these are illegal activities. Because, of course, you want to avoid and want to get as close as possible to the initial cutting of the forest. So you want to detect things very early on. So understanding deforestation as an event has been crucial, not only to me, but to INPI and to Brazil in order to set up systems that control, uh, to try to control deforestation. So this is this is something that has been uh, uh, crucial to us. So I think this is, uh, uh, I would argue, um, a lesson that we have learned from um, the deforestation uh, from, from ontologies into what we do in the data. This is one example I could go many, but I think this one is uh, what perhaps on a crucial one and uh, it helped us a lot in our dealings with government, with the press, with the media and so on. Excellent, uh, Gilberto. I, you know, you have, uh, so some people might not know this, but you had a central uh, role in creating the systems and even uh, in helping to change the policies that made possible uh, the, the transparency of the, the, the geospatial data in Brazil and in particular about the forest. We have next week, our next talk will be by Baron Mons, who's one of the proponents of this idea of fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. So uh, could you please elaborate a bit on this, on the importance of these fair principles for, uh, for, for geodata in particular? Well, they are absolutely essential. Without transparency, there can be no governance. It's like you have a country which you say, OK, there's a system of the law, but you don't know the laws. So you want to say, OK, I want to save the Amazon, but I don't know where people are cutting the trees. So uh, the end, of course, now with COVID, you can you cannot. I mean, life set people, life set uh, stake. So any assertion, assertion you have about the efficacy of any kind of medicine is, is has to be verifiable. The data has to be there. And then then you the one the thing which is interesting is you might think that putting the data there, whatever there means in the cyberspace is uh, the end of things. It's actually the beginning of a questions, huge amount of questions that you know better than me that have to do with what is this data? What is it representing? Uh, what kind of uh, concepts went into, uh, what is this a patient? Is this uh, suspicious of COVID or is this uh, an area which has been identified as clear cut? It's just, it just something I saw last year. Uh, and, and it's, of course, it forces, and I think this is very good, both the data producers and the data users to reason about the data. It's nice in spatial terms, it's nice because you have opinion to look and to verify, but you also have the sense that, uh, you know, you don't get just get the number. Oh, there, there's uh, 1,210 persons with COVID diagnosed with COVID in country X. No, you go into much more detail about what kind of diagnosis it was, 
uh, how it would be, how it would be being detected, and so on and so forth. So uh, making data open is a necessary but initial step towards a better use that can only be done if people share good conceptual models. And that's that's crucial for me. Just to, you just don't put data there and just throw it up in the air and think that anyone can get it. It's just a starting point. Excellent. Absolutely necessary, but just a starting point. Excellent point. Uh, I mean, uh, we cannot have reusability and interoperability without semantic transparency. And we cannot Absolutely. have transparency without this kind of conceptual work you were talking about, right? Absolutely. Thank you. So I'll move to the to the questions uh, from the audience now. So the first one is, is, is the Google statement, I think uh, the person meant uh, Peter Norvig's statement, an anti-scientific statement, in your opinion? Strictly speaking, yes, uh, but uh, depends on where you take the bounds of science. And the question here is, are the bounds of science uh, include uh, uh, what we would call e-science? In other words, is the use of data per itself in exploratory mode for representation part of science? So if you take the point that uh, uh, data can, uh, use of massive data sets can be part of its science. Um, I'm not saying that Peter Novick's statement is uh, becomes scientific, but it becomes a point of discussion. So in that sense is something that we can argue with and say, look, you can succeed without them. This is perhaps a bit stretching too far, but you have to recognize there is power in the data. You cannot uh, take this into an absolute statement. You can't succeed without models. I think data helps us. Uh, there is something as e-science provided that conceptual models are strong. What about scale? Can an object be both object, an object and a field? For example, a mountain in the geological time scale of tectonic plates? Uh, when you talk about natural world, uh, obviously the question of scale is, is very important because scale comes in the sense that we look. So if we are very far from, from let's say the Alps, we look and say there's the Alps, there's the Jura, there's the Dolomites. And then when we come closer to the object, we see, oh, this is Mont Blanc. So obviously scale matters. Uh, and of course, uh, not to say, I would argue, you can look at the same landscape and recognize objects or talk about fields. I would not say an object can be at the same time an object in a field. I would say objects have identities. But of course, the scale matters, both from a personal point of view, you know, the Alps versus Mont Blanc, but also from the satellite point of view. There are satellites at uh, uh, one kilometer resolution. It will measure things different from a satellite at one meter resolution. So scale matters, but identity is hopefully something which is preserved or should be preserved upon scale. The problem of conceptual ambiguity, as in the example of different forest subtypes or in the example of types of co cover or land use, would this be solved by the adoption of multiple orthogonal classification systems, for example, classifying land by cover type and land by use type? Well, I don't I don't think I'm, I'm not, now we're, we're on the realm of investigation. My sense is no, because of the, the net, there's the problems of boundaries and I'm calling boundaries in natural systems. So your problem here is when you say cover type, are you talk, uh, and you talk about grasslands. So are you going to split grasslands from pasture? So it's it's not an obvious thing. You you it's not an obvious thing how you can actually separate land cover and land use. I very much think this is a research question. Uh, I tend to I tend to think that we have to live with it, and I tend to think that it is uh, 
the approach we might want to take is whether, uh, for example, for grasslands and pasture, one of the obvious issue is uh, try to look at what happens in time. So if you are able to happen in time, normally grasslands now uh, being characterized as natural, you would see a natural system coming over time. Whereas a pasture, you would see at a certain moment a human intervention, which has changed the signals of the landscape, has transformed it into a pasture. Uh, there's all reasons that in certain scales you can actually separate both, but the important bit here, you have to characterize agency. And agency is best involved in time. So I'm not convinced that by just taking one slice, you can solve this conceptual ambiguity. Mm -hmm. See. Thanks a lot for the talk. There was a very interesting caveat in your slide with the model on trajectories. What is to you the nature of a trajectory? I see there is an important discussion between measurement uh, observation types, measurement slash observation types, and the earth transformation event types. Should we address both of them or only measure, measurement slash observation types are enough? No, I think we should ask with both of them. The measurement observation types is what we, where we start. And that's, that's I mean, the, that's the issue about geospatial ontologies. You start with observations. That's, that's one of the, because what you have are observations. You can have conceptual classes, but uh, whatever you will, uh, we will identify, it has to be consistent with your observations. So these trajectories are the starting points. That's why I'm still, I mean, I actually used the sort of a caveat here when I said trajectories as measurements of events. So trajectories as indications where we can identify events. So that's that's really a little bit of our problem of how to find events on trajectory. Trajectory purely, strictly speaking, they're, they're not events. They're just measurements. So there is, a, there is one step further to say out of a trajectory, how do I get an event? And how do I reason about events? And, and, and that's an interesting problem because what's a calculus of events? How do you calculate events? How do you, I mean, are events, uh, can you make comp event composition? Which is something which I still argue is it's an open problem. This is a very interesting talk, Gilberto. I think you nicely illustrate why our modeling approach should take an ontological uh, approach. So why our modeling should take an ontological approach. The idea of a trajectory and the fact that a region could undergo transformation that changes classifications is not well supported by non-ontological approach. For example, in a class-based uh, object-oriented programming language, when you instantiate an object, its membership classification is fixed for the duration of its life cycle. So it's about dynamic classification, the need for dynamic classification. So in classical OO uh, programming, we would need to model classification, classifications like forest in a somewhat unnatural way, adding perhaps an orthogonal region type property rather than using a natural classification schemes. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Very right, I fu fully agree. I fully agree. I think you hit the point and thank you very much. And I'm happy that you actually hit this on the nail because that's exactly the point. We, it's, it's, it does, it's not amenable to object-oriented modeling, direct, straightforward, let's say, traditional object-oriented modeling. And, and it's, that's a precisely, a very precise point. In, in fact, if I remember correctly, uh, some of your papers in the very beginning of the 90s uh, about a data modeling in this area, they were using an object-oriented approach, right? And later right. you move more to this kind of ontological approach. So you, you observed that uh, back then yourself, right? Yeah, I actually moved and I, uh, well, I moved in different because, uh, I mean, I can say something that it was, I started doing object-oriented modeling and programming. And then a certain moment in time, I started learning functional programming. So just as an aside, uh, uh, learning Haskell, for example, was an epiphany for me because it allowed me to think out of the OO box uh, and think about functions and functionality as, as, as a prime objector rather than something that acts upon a primary objective like an object. So this helped me a lot. I don't know if it helps others, but for mm -hmm. me, as uh, functional programming uh, is 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 an eye opener for for computer scientists. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think I have the feeling that your that you 
got interested in Haskell during your time in Munster. Yes, absolutely. Oh, doing working with Munster with Andrew Frank in Vienna, who is also a well-known Haskellier, but it was really good. Very nice. Would you agree that sensor data are driven by some ontology or at least decisions about what to measure with what instruments? Different instruments will measure different phenomena. Are that are these underlying assumptions explicated in your field or are they just implicit? They are implicit because the decisions for building sensors uh, sometimes do not, they're not necessarily bound to a conception. I mean, of course, if you have a sensor to measure the temperature of the body, a thermometer, I mean, the two are con the conception and the sensors are there and they match. Now, a satellite, uh, for example, that measures re response of the land in spectral bands is not bound by, it's bound loosely by things, well, I, I measured this from the infrared, I measured this from the near infrared, from the thermal infrared, not necessarily because I want to measure fire, but it is because uh, these signals pass through the atmosphere, my sensor has sensitivity there, so it has been from the beginning uh, technologically driven rather than constant driven. So it's like, like a, not a satellite to measure fires, not a satellite to measure water, but satellite to measure uh, signals that water and fire obtain, but not necessarily optimal for them because of technological, essentially technological constraints on signal to noise, on instruments and so on. How do unsupervised, unsupervised classification fit in this picture in the ontology scheme? This is a question I've been trying to address myself because uh, now currently uh, what I actually started to investigate was uh, can you do machine learning blindly? So in my sense, if you can look at my, my, uh, my presentation was, okay, what can I do with machine learning? Is this worth the hype? Can I do without, uh, you know, is the end of theory? And in this case, machine learning has this paradigm that you have a training samples and then you train the samples with some classifier and then you classify the data. And then I learned a lot about uh, how many samples you need and what is the behavior of these classifiers, what they do, what they don't do. They're very good to fool you and very optimal to and, and very hard to capture some variations which are natural, which are there, but uh, somehow uh, uh, they don't capture. So now with unsupervised classification do the trick. This is a very open question because it would open an area which has been neglected theoretically from the last years, the last decade, because of the emphasis on deep learning and machine learning, which are all basically trained. So if you take the books, uh, the book by, by deep learning or the Hasti and Shibiani book, they all about, most of it is about training. So I think there's a lot that we can think about unsupervised classification. It's just that the theory there has not evolved as fast as the, uh, the other theory about trained models. You mentioned this quote by George Box, all models are wrong, right? So there is one reference here saying uh, that, that, that the entire quote is a bit more complete, saying all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Obtain a correct one, alert to what is importantly wrong. Right. OK, but I mean, quotes are quotes. I mean, uh, I would argue I was trying just to complement uh, to compare Box with Norvig saying you still need to do a modeling uh, in the sense of defending theory, uh, mm -hmm. the sense that not uh, please do not abandon theory and think that you can do uh, blindly, uh, you know, you're, you'll be liberated or rejuvenated by AI and everything will fall from the sky to you. Perhaps Siri would listen to your voice and, and come up with the right response. Mm -hmm. I think this is the danger we face, especially because uh, many of those who are trumpeting this view are not taking the trouble of looking critically at what they're doing. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, in, in complement to that, I think what, what was referred to here is this idea that we should also try to understand the distance between the model and its reference, right? So how wrong it is and why it is wrong. 
Right, right, right. But it's difficult. The problem here is it's difficult with machine learning to understand that because of the overfitting problem. So there is a trick because you select some samples to training and you there is a huge bias, human bias. We select certain things and don't select others. And then we get very good results when we validate our data and think, oh, my data is fantastic. And it's, but it, if your world has a very different, let's say very subtle variations as we find in nature, uh, then uh, this uh, complexity is not captured on the models. And that's, that's the, the separation between the model and the reference becomes more difficult if you just use straightforward machine learning. What's the added value of having an ontology on top of a more classical big data for trajectory analytics approach using, say, a, a SQL technology? OK, so let's take it step by step. Uh, first of all, ontology, I I'm going to argue that ontology is is good by its own sake. OK. So I'm going to, to start this uh, the big old argument, which is it is important that someone who uses big data for Earth observation knows what an event is in the landscape. Now, that doesn't mean that he has an ontological model that makes this, I mean, a computational ontology model that drives the machine learning because that the theory by it would need, as you correctly pointed out, uh, some uh, improvements on, 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 on schemas that we use for describing ontologies to include time. So at this point, what I'm going to uh, have argued is the understanding what you're doing from a conceptual perspective, irrespective if you have the uh, computational model that, that drives the machine learning, is important per se. It makes you wiser and wiser to make less mistakes. Now, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I, no, go ahead, I'll, I'll comment later. I will say, I would hope that by pushing time as a, let's say, a, a concept of, of first degree on ontologies, one can have ontologies that lend itself to really use uh, change dynamics and change in data. We're not there yet, but it doesn't mean that's not important because I think there might be a new generation of ontologies and ontological representations which capture time and make it represent there. But I'm going to argue that even if you don't have a computational ontology that drives machine learning, it's still important to understand what you're doing. I fully agree and I, I thank you very much for making this point that the ontological analysis is much more important than using what people in a in a narrower sense have equated with ontologies more recently, let's say in the past 20 years, with the influence of the semantic web and so on, to equate ontologies with a particular artifact written in a particular logical language, right? You're saying that more important than having an ontology as an artifact is the method of ontological analysis. Absolutely, 100%. Very good. 100%. Recognizing an event out of a time series seems to involve some fiat move or stipulation. Does it make a natural event like a deforestation a fiat entity, according to, to your view? Take entity as a neutral term that stands both for occurrence and continuance. Good and tough question. Uh, I wonder who did it because there's someone who knows his stuff, her or his or her stuff. Well, uh, it is, it is, it is, yes, it's a fiat. You, you're right because we are saying, well, I'm going to have this as a representation of an event, and I'm going to find people who are similar to me. So it involves somehow a way to build, either statistically or otherwise, uh, you know, I want to, it's like, I, Somehow, if I give you a nice time series where the, there's a forest going and then there is a cut, you should be able, trained human being, to recognize it. 
and because you have a, a sense of that. How do you convey this cogn cognitive understanding of a change into, uh, into a, a computational model? You build some fiat of say, oh, here, here's where, what you need to find. So I agree, you need a model that uh, here's what you need to find. And, and by definition, you would, uh, I, 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 I hate to say the word object here, but if you take a loose sense, I agree, it is a fiat object. I'm just saying it is a fiat entity that allows you to say, oh, here's something I, interesting. Concerning to events, you suggest that objects exist and events occur. However, we may say that the very existence of a, an object is itself an event in time. For example, planet X has existed during time Y. Then it has disappeared because of another event. For example, uh, the, the, it's been absorbed by a black hole. How do you see this ubiquitous view of events? I guess it's a reference to this 4D view in which everything is an event. OK, uh, I'm going here. I mean, this is the Again, tough and, and to the point question. This is the famous, uh, let's say, uh, philosophical entity. And for me, again, I am arguing that I, you have to, 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 you sort of uh, drink upon uh, the work of others in this case. And in this case, you might recognize that I've been influenced by people like Barry Smith on the snap and span ontologies. In other words, he he, under, he considers there is an ontology for continuance and one for occurrence. That's obviously it's a it's it's a pre-conceived point, and out of that you you that's where you get events as simply events as occurring and uh, and objects as existing. Uh, I fully concede that you can take a completely different point of view, and you're going to arrive at different circumstances. Uh, but from someone who wants to use this, you need to take a standpoint and to be consistent within it. And that's what I've tried to do. And so it's a, it's a most uh, Smithian, you know, uh, non 4 d uh, approach, which is one way to cut the cake. There are others. So the next question, I will identify this one because I made several reference to Nicola's talk and you did as well. So it's a question from Nicola. Hi, Gilberto, very nice talk. I'm very sympathetic with your approach, of course, especially your emphasis on events. Still, however, I would like to better understand the intrinsic limitations of machine learning techniques. If overfit is the main problem, can't we imagine more sophisticated learning algorithms that are able to deal with the problem? So I guess the question is, is this an intrinsic limitation or is it refers to the state of our knowledge? Can we evolve to a state in which models are not needed? Okay, well, thank you, Nicola. Nicola, you know, I, I have like to state for the record for everybody that I'm the ones that has enormous benefit from reading Nicola's work. You know, this is someone who I treasure and I respect immensely, and he has done so much good from the ontological community. That said, I think, Nicola, this is the debate that we're having. If you take, like, the proponent of the very critical approach if you could take the recent book by Judea Pearl uh, on causality and the book of why. What uh, Pearl and uh, there's also Gary Marcus on a recent book about AI. What they've been saying is that there is this uh, limit in three, there are the current generation, it's not machine learning as such, but the current generation of techniques which are based on the function approximation. Essentially, you're approximating a decision function on, 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 on in, in hyperdimensional space, uh, have intrinsic limitations, and you, you never get to a point where they do cognition. It's the famous example that uh, self-driving cars don't recognize a stop sign upside down, where we as humans do. So I would argue Nicola is right in the sense that the current generation has intrinsic limitations when we talk about cognitive issues. That does not mean that that would evolve. That this overfitting issue is, I would argue, hardwired into this current generation of function. It's essentially a problem of optimi optimization in, in dimensional space. And you have to live with it. It's not something that you, it goes away magically. You have to live with it 
and understand that this uh, current paradigm of function approximation is only the beginning of a much bigger discussion. Uh, but I would recommend those interested read uh, the book of Y by Judy F.O., uh, for example, or Gary Marcus' work, which is an uh, interesting discussion on these limitations. There is a, the, I, I like very much both books, and I think there is, uh, there was, I think last year, um, the, the, the published a book that I think it's uh, very much in line with uh, Gary Marcus' book, and, uh, and extremely interested published by Melanie Mitchell. It's called Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for the Thinking Human. And uh, Melanie Mitchell will be a speaker in this series in three weeks. Oh, fantastic, fantastic, so. fantastic. Oh, that's that's very good. No, you're really getting, you know, I'm humbled now because the company of these people, you know, this is very good. As I said, we only got to world-class uh, researchers. I'm very happy with everything in the series. And uh, okay. I, I, you know, I hope people join the uh, join this talk as well with Melanie Mitchell. It will be a very interesting discussion, and we will connect exactly to the point you just made. Great. Um, it seems that the way to proceed is to combine symbolic and non-symbolic approaches. Any ideas? If you agree on how to combine these two things? No, I agree on the ideas that you need to combine symbolic and non-symbolic approaches. That's that's for me. It's 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 being recognized as a way to proceed. How to do it is the tough because of our problems with the representation. I think this is, goes back to the issue of RDF or similar OWL, and these representations that we had, and uh, which try to describe properties of objects and so on. And then, as um, someone uh, correctly uh, uh, pointed out in the other questions, and then where is time? How does time fit into this matter? So this is this is. I would argue that to do the symbolic bit right, we we need to to capture at least say on the problem that I'm facing, which is the uh, Earth's observation, Earth's landscape, Earth's environment. Time is fundamental. Change is fundamental. So that's where uh, the conceptual work uh, from the symbolic point of view is the one who is let's say. Uh, the one who will improve a lot the 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 the, the let's say the non-symbolic the numeric work. It's 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 the tough part. Mm -hmm. One approach, you know. Sorry, sorry. Go no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say that one approach that uh, you know people have used in the past or and still use to try to to make a connection between the uh, the symbolic and the sub-symbolic, let's say, approach is the approach of uh, using geometric models, right? and the, the, the idea of a conceptual space. So there is the famous book by Peter Gardeforce, who, by the way, will also be a speaker in the series. Uh, so the Fantastic. geometric space and the uh, conceptual space, the geometry of thoughts. So can you say something about this as well, the idea of geometric models as a glue between the symbolic and sub-symbolic? Well, it, it's now becoming more and more, uh, I know, I mean, I work, I read Gardeforce, but, uh, I would not, I need some thinking about how to put that because the problem here is we have a, con in nature, we have a continuum. And this continuum is approximated by, you know, descriptions we do. And when we measure them with, uh, with satellites, uh, we go back to the continuum because satellites measure what comes out of the earth. You know, they don't know if this is savanna or a forest, it just, they know that there is a, uh, a, a signal coming up. So the whole deal here is this continuum. And how do you capture this? And I have to think, uh, the idea of, uh, of discussing conceptual spaces is certainly useful, and I'm sure something important can come out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think there is space for different approaches for the symbolic area. Gladden Force is one very influential uh, thinker there. So it might be one of the ways by which we get out of the current, uh, let's say, the current impasse that we're facing. Is every trajectory associated to an individual quality in the sense of Dolce and UFO? If so, a trajectory describes the chains of a quality in a conceptual space. Good question. The problem here is that, strictly speaking, Trajectories are associated to measurements. 
And so it's not like uh, you can take, for example, if a COVID patient, so you could measure the blood uh, blood flux from the from the the, the 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 lungs, right? And then you can have a trajectory of you know 11, 11, 10, 11, 12, whatever, whatever. So you have a trajectory in time, but the the cons concept of uh, you know uh, oxygenation in the lungs is there. Now, in our observation, NDVI is simply an index that sort of is a measure, but not really associated to the quantity of forest which is there. So there is a leap of faith there. That's that's where uh, we cannot simply assume uh, that there is a trajectory of forestness. We still have to pick up. There is an intermediate step, which is done implicitly when we class classify which is translate these measures of uh, response in the near infrared band and over time to quantity of uh, whatever chlorophyll, which relates to quantity of uh, trees in there. And this is this is space is where uh, the symbolic matches the 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 numeric. Now it tends to be traditionally numeric approaches to do this in a symbolic way have not yet succeeded because they need to be matched with the numeric and that's where I think this is boundary between the observation and its conceptual representation is really the place where this matching needs to be done. Um, there is another reference to, to George Box. So the question is, so we better say that models might be wrong, but they are useful instrument if they are used with skills and care. And then a reference to uh, the intrinsic limitations of a theory to approximate the phenomenon. Right. I, I mean, I, I agree. I, perhaps next time I'm going to come up with a better quote for George Box because that one came up. You know, I agree. I, I, I probably, I, the, the quote that I should have used in retrospect is another one, uh, which we use a lot on, on the geosciences community, which is, uh, um, the models are believed by no one apart from the pe person who developed them, and data is believed uh, is believed by everyone except the person who collected it. So this is, in a certain sense, uh, data is messy, and this is one of the things that uh, when you get the fair, you're going to be confronted. Data is really messy, and therefore models are nice in the sense that they organize the messiness, but sometimes they simplify too much because. That's the sense of what I gather from Vox. Uh, some you use them. I mean, we need models for COVID. We need models for for greenhouse gases. We need models for uh, the Earth. Uh, are they right or wrong? It's beside the point in this case. So we need to see if they all are pointing up what's going to happen in a, a world of four degrees uh, average uh, temperature hotter than we have in here. So. Mm -hmm. In that sense, perhaps models are certainly useful right? in most cases, but I, I, I'm going to think of a better code next time. In land, in land system science, we often study land use uh, change degradation from different sides of the coin. Remote sensing and qualitative approach to capture local actors, farmers, policymakers uh, knowledge. To what extent can ontology serve in, in integrating these different types of data to understand the reality of land use change? Well, I'm going to argue that you already, the person who's saying this is already doing ontology in the big old philosophical sense, because he's doing conceptual modeling. He is understanding what it means for the farmer. So he's thinking uh, beyond the numerical box. Like I said, the difficulty here is not to recognize that we need a combination of symbolic and the numeric. I think most people would agree that we need is how to do it. And, and that's uh, I, uh, so you're already doing it. I mean, what is hard is to transform, uh, let's say, the concept of an agent, considering, for example, a uh, human agent who is uh, planting soy into uh, the response you get numerically from 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 a classification model. This is this is a there is it's not easy to do it on a machine to machine basis. It's obvious if you understand it, 
that there is a need for machine to human translation, human to machine translation, then I would argue that if even if you don't know, talk about it explicitly, you're already doing conceptual modeling. Gilberto, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's very generous of you to offer your time to, to give this talk and to answer all these questions. This was great. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you because I, I mean, for me, it is an honor to be in the companion of such distinguished guests. And let me say again, uh, I've learned so much from your community that I feel that it was just an obligation to share some of my thinking with you. I hope it could be useful and uh, it was enormous pleasure to I'm meet very, you. Very, and, very happy to hear that.